Uh, I just uh, wanted to know whether my slides are available to be seen now. Yes, yes, visible. Yes, yeah. I thank uh, Dr. Srinivas, uh, Dr. Thirumurgan, and Dr. Balakrishnan for this opportunity. As Ranjit Pejavad mentioned earlier, Tamil Nadu is way ahead of us in Karnataka and the rest of the country in terms of neonatal care. But I'm going to have again a discussion with our major twist, which lasts uh, four or five decades, even as us senior neonatologists have always been uh, having to deal with, that is newborn sepsis. So it has always been a challenge, whatever intensive care you do, whatever we do as see the nicely spoke so eloquently about diaphragmatic hernia and its management, Episodes of sepsis can reduce your morbidity, it can reduce the survival and increase morbidity in children. And unfortunately, it's a big stress for both parents and all of us looking after babies who are septic to pick them early and to treat them. So I'm going to start with a little preamble to the whole thing by uh, talking about the current situation, which is quite alarming even now, as recently as five years back, the Delhi Newborn Intensive Care Study has suggested an incidence of almost 15% uh, sepsis in term babies in hospitalized newborns, out of which culture positive about six to seven percent. And early onset sepsis is about two thirds of these babies. But the worst thing is the early onset sepsis organisms and the Late onset sepsis organisms are the same gram negative, which we fear most, the Klebsiella's, the Acinotobacters, and the E. coli. Case fatality rates have been published by the All India Institute group. As much as 30 to 50% case fatality rates are seen. Mortality, some data suggest that late onset sepsis is more, but I would say any sepsis, when you deal with it, you're always confronted with the likelihood of mortality so you have to be very, very cautious. The worst is of course, multi-drug resistance is increasing now, incidences of as much as 48, 38 to almost 90% to most of the standard use drugs, even the higher antibiotics. So we need to have a standard protocol for an early diagnosis and to treat it appropriately. Now, unfortunately in this country, I'm going to again address this issue that prophylactic antibiotics unnecessarily started comprise almost about 50% of the times are unnecessary to be given. In NICOs, we find that 50% of the times the babies are receiving antibiotics unnecessarily. It's estimated that about 11 to 23% of the non-infected babies are giving antibiotics for every one neonate who has actually need for that. So this is something we need to remember. Now, the reasons are probably not much to go by. We know that the signs and symptoms of neonatal sepsis are non-specific and times have very florid symptoms emanate in babies. And the fear factor, especially the worry about mortality if untreated is prevalent in most pediatricians mind. Higher antibiotics are easily available. Monetary resistance has started. And also there's no real ideal test in a culture negative situation. So we are really floundering in the dark as uh, Saurabh Ratta recently in a lecture said, the typical neonatologist is as if trying to shoot in the dark with a torchlight without knowing where he's shooting at. That is exactly what many of us are doing. So my aim is to see whether we can try to arrive at some kind of a realistic approach to the diagnosis of neonatal sepsis so that we don't miss any case of sepsis, which needs to be really aggressively treated. We minimize the over-treatment of non-infected babies, minimize the duration of antibiotic treatment for those which are proven, uh, proven uninfected. And of course, giving a safe observation protocol for the babies who are at risk, whose septic screening is negative, but then we have not given antibiotics, we should not want to miss any infection if it's brewing in these babies. So this is the kind of steps that I'm going to take in the next 15 minutes or so. Now, first of all, we have to say when we have to not give antibiotics. Unfortunately, I have had to put this slide because many, many small centers and maybe in the periphery, just because a baby is born with an elective cesarean sector or an emergency cesarean sector, even term babies, healthy babies, late preterms, healthy, even moderately preterm babies, we would not really 
ask you to start antibiotics. This is fundamentally very important. We have to understand that. And I realized from Dr. Srinivas in the morning today that uh, many pediatricians in the uh, group here today are general pediatricians who are looking after newborns. And I would really request them, even in situations of asphyxiated babies, exchange transmissions, if done with correct precautions, dehydration fever. And in the COVID now, we see a lot of babies with viral infections with even COVID, bronchiolitis we see, antibiotics are started. So the basic principle is if there's no bacteria, we should not be giving any antibiotics at all. The other thing is the so-called word of prophylactic antibiotics, I think should be completely discouraged. We have to decide that there is a need for antibiotic and then give it only if there's decent evidence for that. Yes, we are worried about uh, increasing the risk of uh, morbidity in babies whom we don't give antibiotics, but then please look at the other angle. The same antibiotics will not work if you are going to use it multiple times because resistant organisms are going to develop. Nosocomial infections in your nursery are going to increase with worse bugs if you keep on giving antibiotics. So it causes the preponderance to antibiotic resistance. Now we have three situations I can understand of neonatal sepsis. One is a baby who is born asymptomatic with one or more risk factors for sepsis, born from a mother whose the baby is otherwise well, he may be a term baby or he may be a late preterm baby, or a baby comes to your outpatient or comes to your casualty with, from home or maybe from the community with features of clinical sepsis, or there's a baby already in your nursery, it may be a small baby, she may be a late, late preterm, or, and has developed non-specific signs of neonatal sepsis. The scenarios, now if the baby is um, having the perinatal risk factors for sepsis as we call it, which, are, which I'll delineate a little bit later, the baby can be asymptomatic or if you closely observe this baby in the next 72 hours, the baby can start developing features of early sepsis, which you have to closely clinically watch for. Or if the baby is really born in a very septic state, prompted by the presence of symptoms in the mother, like foul smelling like her, or fever in the mother, or there is severe fetal tachycardia, these babies need to be addressed at the time of birth. Now, not now, 35 years back, Professor Baku, my teacher from PGI Chandigarh, had published this, and even AIMS protocols have re-emphasized this, that you have to score the risk factors for infection in these babies for early onset sepsis. These are the standard ones we all know about, asphyxia, unclean vaginal examinations, false smelling liquor, prolonged rupture of membranes, duration of labor more than 24 hours, maternal pyrexia, and of course, if it's a low birth weight or a preterm baby. If your score is three or more, then you would probably do a septic workup. Six or more, you would probably do a workup and start antibiotics as well while waiting for the blood culture report. So if the score is two or more and at the time of birth, or if the baby has subtle non-specific clinical signs, the baby who's come from the community or the child has already been in your nursery under your care. The prophylactic antibiotics in PROM, there's a lot of conflicting reports, but again, it's again important to realize that even in PROM, if there's more than 24 hours, most of the recommendations would suggest now that it is possible for you to do a septic workup, take a blood culture, preferably start antibiotics if the screen is positive, even if it's a more than 24 hours PROM, but definitely if you have started, you should stop it if the blood culture comes negative. Meconium, there's no doubt at all. More and more of us now believe, and there's enough data, and there is now cochlear meta-analysis available, which says, even if you start antibiotics in meconium, it doesn't alter the course of the disease. It doesn't reduce the incidence of sepsis or you don't really need, for, need to therefore give it. So antibiotics are given in meconium only if the baby is closely observed and you find there's a trend to worsen, then you can start antibiotic, but prophylactically it should not be started. Now, if you have a baby who has subtle symptoms or even overt symptoms of sepsis, most of the times you'll see that this is the data which is available at 50% and above there will be very overt symptoms of sepsis, hyperthermia, respiratory distress, tachycardia, lethargy, or poor feeding. Maybe less than 25% of the times we'll have non-specific symptoms like uh, 
poor feeding, lethargy, or irritability. So you can be rest assured that the baby will give you some indication that the baby has sepsis, and you can work on that by doing a septic screen. There are lots of clinical scores which are earlier on developed. This is Dr. Guha's score, which he had given long back, about 20 years back, which are based on the skin temperature, color, and the capillary filling time, which even we, even now in our unit, in a baby at a high risk setting, the baby is born with a perinatal risk score, which is high, let's say more than three. Most of my residents will be clinically monitoring the babies for especially these kind of, uh, these kind of parameters. The other scores, which uh, my friend and colleague from Trivandrum, Dr. Naveen Jain, last about seven years has been validating and which we use in our unit most of the times in a baby who has a setting for sepsis, which I think all pediatricians should probably start adapting, is look at the sensorium of the baby. If you feel from the time two hours before to now, the sensorium is slowly worsening, the child is not as active as what he was looking, there is a temperature difference of more than two and it's increasing to more than three or four degrees centigrade between the central core temperature, which could be the skin temperature on the abdomen or the axillary temperature versus the peripheral temperature, if you feel it's increasing. The heater output, for example, if you look at the heater output here, let's say two hours back, the child was just needing about 25% heater output. And now the child is requiring 75% heater output. And the child is also becoming tachycardic. This would be probably an early indication of sepsis. Oxygen saturation levels are not maintained. You need to give oxygen or the increase in need for oxygenation is there. This is, would be a good tool clinically to follow. Now, I'm happy to say that when we started uh, doing this and we picked up babies very early, in fact, as recently as about two months back, we picked up a baby with early sepsis and then we could act before the baby could get into septic shock. Dr. Naveen Jain has now validated this through a publication recently, which I'll share with you a little later. So this can be remembered for general pediatricians or even neonatal pediatricians in nurseries. The STOPS tool, as we call it, is a simple clinical tool which even the nurses can follow and this can give early evidence to sepsis and you can pick up sepsis, at least in the setting where you think there's a high risk for sepsis, you can pick it up. The septic screen is a standard thing which all of us know, but suffice to say that you have to look at CRP mm -hmm. Especially the CRP is very high. I'm not looking at borderline CRPs. If the child has a setting for CRP and the child is having subtle signs of sepsis, if the CRP is very high, let's say 50, 60 or 100, I would take that very seriously. If it is just 16, 17 or something, we can still wait and see. Immature to mature neutrophils is a very good thing to go by. It's got a very high sensitivity and specificity for picking up sepsis. If you look at all these armamentariums in the hematology which we have, I would say CRP stands out very high with a high negative predictive value. So this is a very nice uh, thing which you can be rest assured that if you do a CRP quantitatively and if it is less than 10 milligrams per deciliter and it's got a negative predictive value of almost close to 100, you can be safely sure that yes, the baby may not be septic. But if you want to be sure, and you think the clinical setting was such that the baby is likely to be probably septic and probably it's brewing in the body, you can probably repeat a CRP or repeat a combination of the white blood cell count and the CRP and the immature to total neutrophil ratio. If it is more than 0 0.2, it would indicate probably that the baby is septic. So this is a very nice uh, kind of uh, tool which you have for picking up sepsis early. The peripheral blood smear is another thing we often forget, but in the periphery, especially in the labs, which are well developed in many small district hospitals also, if a good peripheral smear and we as pediatricians and as PG students in the PG days at Chandigarh, we would even see the peripheral smears ourselves to look for band cells, toxic granules, leukopenia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. So you can look at evidence for sepsis in these peripheral smears also. Recently, one of our uh, neonatology DNB students has uh, written a thesis on 100 babies with a mean gestation of 38 gest each gestation, out of which one fourth were culture positive gram negative sepsis. We have found that the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio has got an 85 
percent sensitivity and 95 percent specificity for picking up sepsis. The platelet to lymphocyte ratio also can pick it up to as much as 89 percent sensitivity specificity, and the mean platelet volume also as much as 88 percent is specific for sepsis. So these are all simple calculations which are available on an automated Coulter counter in the hematology lab. If you're working in a good center, you can pick this up and you can correlate it with the CRP. You can probably see that it correlates very well with CRP quantitatively, and you can even use it as a good tool to confirm whether sepsis is there or not. So you have markers which are already existing, which are fairly good along with these new additional hematological markers. As I mentioned earlier, a negative screen definitely rules out neonatal sepsis. You can be rest assured, you can probably, yes, you can keep a kind of uh, controlled environment, control observation of the child maybe for another 24 hours and then decide to discharge the child if you think so, or you want to repeat a septic screen, again, you can do and look it out whether it's negative or not. But if the two parameters in the septic screen are positive, it's better to take a blood culture and start antibiotics. But then it's very important to stop the antibiotics if the blood cultures are negative. As I said, if you are still worried, you can repeat a septic screen after 12 to 24 hours if you feel worried, especially if it's a preterm baby. The blood culture has been a gold standard for the diagnosis of neonatal sepsis, but it takes a lot of time to conventional blood cultures take 48 to 72 hours to come back. But then the back tech is a calorimetric system, which the advantage is data has shown, in fact, recent uh, published data has shown just as late, as late as about 2019 or so, that if the child is growing a gram negative bacillus, the back tech can pick it up within 24 to maximum 30 hours. So it can be rest assured that if it is negative, even at 24 to 30 hours, there's no gram negative organism. So you can decide whether you want to stop the antibiotic, which you think you're giving it for a broad spectrum coverage of gram negative antibiotic. Now, as far as the lumbar puncture is concerned, yes, definitely, especially in late onset sepsis, we should do. To do it once the baby is hemodynamically stable and there's no bleeding diastasis and the platelet is more than one lakh, one lakh per millimeter cube. Now, this is just a kind of algorithm which I'm showing here. If you have an asymptomatic baby with one or more risk factors for sepsis and the gestation is less than 34 weeks, you have to do a septic screen and take blood culture and start antibiotics. If the gestation is less than 35 weeks, can start antibiotics. But if the septic screen comes negative, you can stop the antibiotic if the child is looking well. Or if you feel the child is still having some symptoms like respiratory distress or mottling, or the child is not feeding well, abdominal distension, whatever your symptoms are, you can repeat a septic screen. Now, if you repeat a septic screen and again it's negative and the blood culture by then is also negative, we would suggest that you should stop the antibiotics and discharge maybe after four or five days. If on the other hand, the blood culture comes positive and septic screen was also positive, then you would have to treat the baby for 10 to 14 days, depending on whether it's a gram positive organism or a gram negative organism respectively, or three weeks if the lumbar puncture also shows evidence of meningitis. Blood cultures being negative, though the septic screen being positive, if the child is gestationally less than 35 weeks, you can give for seven days. And if the child recovers and is not symptomatic, you can stop it. Now, this is an algorithm we have found it fairly useful in our clinical day-to-day -day working. If the gestation is more than 35 weeks, if the baby's septic screen alone is enough, you don't have to still take a blood culture and the child is asymptomatic, but the risk factors are there. Then if the screen is positive, take a blood culture, start appropriate antibiotics. If the culture comes positive, then you do a lumbar puncture and treat the child appropriately for 10 to 14 days and meningitis for three weeks. If the blood culture is negative, then of course, clinically you feel the child had definitely signed and had symptoms of sepsis, which are still prolonged, then keep it going for seven days or so. But if the child is looking better, in fact, recently we had a dilemma in our NICU this baby, one of us consultants thought we should stop antibiotics. One of us thought we should continue for total seven days. But then 
If you're going to decide to stop it, then you can still keep a close watch on the baby if the baby is specially available for you to review again. Now, the septic screen being negative is a big concern. So if you feel there is a need to do it again, please do it again. You observe the child for 72 hours, if the child is asymptomatic, discharge, if the baby develops symptoms, then of course take a blood culture and treat the child with antibiotics till the blood culture comes positive, whatever you can change the antibiotics. Now, in a symptomatic child, there's no confusion at all. A child is severely symptomatic, which all of us now have started recognizing. Of course, there may be other, uh, other sem sem uh, sepsis uh, kind of uh, 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 masquerading sepsis, many other diseases are there. But nevertheless, if you feel the child is hemodynamically unstable, you take a blood culture, start antibiotics, lumbar puncture when the child is stable. And of course, if the sepsis screen uh, and the cultures come back negative, and the child also starts getting better, it would be worthwhile stopping the antibiotics after 72 hours if the child gets better, if you feel really the cultures. So the intention is to, again, emphasize the fact that you should try to stop the antibiotics, especially if the child seems to be better and clinically you feel there was some other reason for it, for the child to have deteriorated. Cultures, if they are positive and the sepsis screen is also positive, then of course you would need to continue antibiotics for the duration if required. Now, if you feel mild to moderate symptoms have happened, the baby has been stable, you can check for other reasons like hypothermia, hypoglycemia, acidosis, etc. Perform a septic screen. You don't let go of the baby. You're not, we're not asking you to do that. You reevaluate the child. If the child's screen subsequently reconfirms that it is positive then you can. But if suppose a child repeatedly screens negative, you can even send home, but then re-evaluation is required. Even calling the child next day makes sense till you're very, very sure. So we are just suggesting a protocol where the close observation of the child happens. If the child is just born, can we start antibiotics? Yes, provided there are three antenatal risk factors and more like maternal fever, prolonged rupture of membranes, and let's say unclean vaginal examinations, or if there's severe foul smelling like it. Now, this is a debatable question. Maybe I can answer some questions on that. There is not really much data on this, but nevertheless, in fact, recently in one seminar, Dr. Saurabh Datta was of the opinion from Chandigarh that we should not be starting, but this is a debatable issue. If you're worried, you can start antibiotics, take the cultures, take the screening and stop it soon as you feel it's come negative and the child is better. The debatable question is how long do we give antibiotics for? <coughs> Asymptomatic blood culture and screening negative three days if the child has especially improved. Symptomatic blood culture negative but screen positive. Conservative approach would be seven days because the child was symptomatic to start with. Proven sepsis, 10 to 14 days. Gram positive uh, would be 14 days meningitis. Gram negative meningitis, 21. These are all arbitrary figures made long, long back. And people really don't know whether these are the correct, appropriate things to do. But a lot of recent data has shown that if you do serial CRPs and the CRP becomes negative, you can stop antibiotic. If the CRP comes to less than 10, you can stop the antibiotic provided the child is asymptomatic or very minimally symptomatic. This is what would be the current recommendation. Now, I have talked about all the conventional hematological and other markers for sepsis all along this. So what about the newer markers, which are the ones which we are hearing about now? Let's look at the timeline. A baby has a risk factors for sepsis. The baby still has not developed symptoms. Pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, IL-8 can probably rise in response to the sepsis very early, within about 12 hours after the baby becomes septic. So these can be assessed in the blood. And these, I'll show you some data on this. Subsequently, the symptoms develop. Then you do the standard. When the baby develops standard symptoms, you'll develop, you'll do this routine one, like I told the hematology or the CRP and other things. The rapid culture techniques also subsequently will prove that there is sepsis. We have been using a lot of serum lactate through capillary blood as point of care, as uh, doc, uh, we were discussing earlier, 
This also gives us some idea whether the baby is, uh, especially if the child is sick, ventilated, and we find there's a serial increase in lactate and the child is not showing any other symptoms or sign, we would take it seriously and look for any evidence of sepsis by doing some of these pro-inflammatory markers or the other markers. So there is now definite need in this last about five to six years. Uh, can you yeah, just five uh, minutes more. I'm going to, this is the last uh, thing. So more and more of us are looking at uh, biomarkers, which are likely to probably be used more in the future. future. Procalcitonin has a very good kind of um, uh, uh, diagnostic accuracy and it can be easily given to monitor the antibiotic uh, stewardship. This is the same study which I was referring to, Naveen Jain has published recently, which is documented that it works and it is as good as procalcitonin. PCR-based technology, Professor Bhatt himself has published this study five years back that PCR is probably as good as blood cultures in picking up the organism. Only thing is it can't tell you the sensitivity and many of us have started using this, especially if conventional blood cultures are going to take some time and we can therefore try to use a narrower spectrum of antibiotic. Genomics is going to be probably the future. A lot of research is going on in this. Biophysical markers like the heart rate variability monitoring some people are using. And also we are also coming to know that a lot of computerized algorithms are also coming into the use of monitoring babies. This is all the data which is all available, PCR, uh, PCT and CRP are equally effective in sensitivity and specificity cytokines and ND64, NCD64, which are also probably in the offing. And there are now risk calculators for early onset sepsis, which are based on a lot of algorithm, which is available. But basically the future trends in neonatal sepsis seem to be moving away from the conventional markers towards advanced biomarkers and population-based and advanced That's monitoring right. algorithms. So I'd like to finish my talk here. If there are any questions, most willing to answer. Sorry for the little, um, you know, crossing the time. Thank you so much.